Hi, I'm Claire Ezekiel, instructor of French at the University of West Georgia. Please enjoy this recorded Q&A for the movie Sybil. So joining me today for this discussion is Professor Christine Fuchs from the University of West Georgia. And we are discussing the film Sybil today in this Q&A. So thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So Christine Fuchs is an instructor in the theater program at West Georgia and also the coordinator of the BIS and the film Pathway. Um, and so we do appreciate you being here because of your unique perspective that you can give in many different areas of this film. So thank you again. My pleasure. So just to give a really quick overview of our film before we get started with our questions in the Q&A, um, this film is by Justine Trier, uh, the director of the film. And the film follows Sybil, a psychotherapist, who decides to quit her successful practice and write a second novel. So we learn that just as she's about to leave the practice, a young actress, Margot, desperately reaches out to her for help with a kind of unique situation. And so as Margot's situation is revealed throughout the film, Sybil is drawn to her story and begins to use it in her new novel. And so the film is us watching these two worlds collide and kind of get intermingled a little bit between Margot and Sybil. And through that, we learn of the mirroring in the lives. So with that in mind about our film, uh, I have some questions here. And our questions are a combination of faculty made questions and student questions. Um, so first of all, I'd like to just thank everyone that submitted a question. This, you know, this film festival is only possible with our participation from the viewers and everyone watching. So thank you everyone that submitted a question. Um, our questions, I tried to break down into a few different themes. So the first theme is about reality in the film, because mm. we know that reality is a loaded word in this film, for sure. Wow. And the second theme is on the characters in the film. And then the third theme is about uh, the idea that there is a film inside the film, the meta aspect that you mentioned in your introduction. So I thought we could just go ahead and jump in. Sure. So my first question for you is, the film plays with time and multiple layers of reality and fiction. So you have Sybil's past, you have her current life, you have Margot's current reality, you have this fictional story in the film, mm -hmm. and you also have Sybil's book going on. So what does this show the audience about Sybil? Where is she in these realities? Yeah, for sure. It's a great question. I thought a lot about that because Watching the film, I thought a lot about how it jumps from the past, the present, the future even. Um, and how does Sybil relate to all of those parts of her life? So I think that it's really interesting how the, the director, of course, plays with time, plays with reality. So I don't know if it's necessarily a commentary on Sybil as more as a, 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 a playing with time, a playing with how we view time, how we view our relationship to our past, our, our relationship to our present. And um, uh, I think the, the director does an amazing job of playing with that because it took me a minute to, to catch on to what she was doing, how she was jumping from uh, uh, the timelines going back to her relationship with Gabrielle and then uh, uh, her mother dying and all those things and then her present reality and then of course moving forward with Margot's story. So I think that the, it, to me it was more of a commentary on the director playing with fluidity of time and what is our reality. I don't know if it's a yeah. <laughs> no I, I agree it's a fantastic point thank you so much for that. Uh, it definitely does show this mixing of realities in not just the layers of the story, like I mentioned, but also you're right in the layers of time that are shown because we have a combination of flashback, we have time progressing in the film, and then at a certain point in the film, we have a pretty significant jump into the future. Mm -hmm. And so we, we do have multiple layers of time happening kind of vertically, horizontally in all directions that, that as a viewer, you have to really pay attention to and it, yeah, figure out where are we, what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that really struck me. Um, uh, I had to watch the film a couple of times, actually, because I was like, all right, wait, because I'm, I'm very linear in my thinking. 
uh, uh, especially as an actor, because I'm like, I need a beginning, a middle and an end. And <clears throat> I, I thought it was such a unique device that she did, especially with the story going into the novel and a film being a film. It was all this jumping back and forth. And I, I kind of felt like she's really challenging the viewer. The director was really challenging the viewer to really pay attention and to really understand this woman's trajectory and really understand her, I guess her her own crisis. I mean, Sybil's have in crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes, and definitely. She, she gave a lot of backstory, which I felt really helpful. But I had to go back and go, oh, this is when this is happening. So, and how do we? How do we deal with all the happenings of our, you know, I'm a different person today than I was yesterday than I was last year, but I can still think about those things that happened to me in the past and how they inform me today. So that was really, really unique. And that's a fantastic point actually that leads me into my second question. So uh, my second question is on this idea of the memories in the past. So mm -hmm. even though Sybil tells her therapist that she can't make herself go back into her memories of the past and her relationship with Gabrielle, the audience knows that not only can she, but she often does, right? She yeah. often revisits the past. Yeah. So from a production perspective, you know, from the perspective of maybe the director, what do you think the purpose is in telling the story to have the so many glimpses into her past? We're multi-dimensional beings. We are multifaceted. There's, there's so much. And what I found really fascinating about that was we all deny our the things that happen to us, and we all say, "Oh no, I'm fine." Oh, that wasn't me. You know, she even says in the movie, you know, I'm I'm fine, I'm cool, collected. Her sister even brings it up. Oh no, you're you're you have it all together. And it's like, no, we're all we're all surviving, we're all a mess inside. So yeah. <laughs> I I really enjoyed that because she has this facade of I'm a therapist and I'm in control and I have everything, you know, everything is perfect. Even her stillness, if you watch the actresses uh, 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 in the character of the therapist, it, she's very still, she's very composed, almost very stoic. And then I loved seeing her get really blotto and <laughs> really drunk and seeing that side of her. And then of also being a caretaker and being a lover, being a passionate person. We're so multifaceted, we, we of course we're gonna deny. Of course, we're going to deny. We all do. I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> Definitely. And an interesting note about that actress, actually, Virginie Efira. Mm -hmm. She is known and they has been. <laughs> <laughs> she's known, actually, as a comedic actress. And this film, she was really looking to push the boundaries in. And wow, does she do it? I mean, it's unbelievable to watch this yes. performance and she i think steals the show in this oh, film for sure. it's beautiful performance i'm mm -hmm. amazed and i can't wait to see what what's gonna come uh from her next and also this is what her th her third film with the director so mm -hmm. uh uh yeah they have a beautiful working relationship together mm -hmm. definitely yeah. yeah so now this is perfect uh kind of leads us into our second theme on the characters in the film and so um, we've talked a little bit about Sybil's profession as the psychotherapist. Um, and, you know, we've talked a little bit about this, the layers of everything, but in the film, uh, we have Sybil as her profession it being a prominent component of her character. Mm -hmm. And in the film, the co-producer of the film that Margot is in, he says to them, he says, oh, it's reassuring to have such a level-headed person like you on the set. Mm -hmm. So what's the irony of this? Oh, it's so ironic. I, I love that because, it, I mean, therapists need therapists. I mean, can you imagine listening to, you know, people's problems all day and then you, you have your own life to live and you're going to have your own problems as well. And I just thought it was so ironic because I was like, just because you're a therapist does not make you not human. And 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 the perception that we have of therapists that they have it all together yes it's their job yes they're being paid but they are still human so i thought it was really <laughs> a little um uh, short-sighted on on the producer's part but how interesting because he is basically stereotyping her 
you know, saying you're the level-headed person. It could be the, the the guy with the who's got the boom operator the, who has the microphone. He could be the most level-headed person, but just because he's a boom operator doesn't make him the expert. I don't know. That doesn't. It just didn't make sense to me. I remember laughing out loud at that at that part because on the outside she looks perfect, but on the inside she's unraveling. And wow, what an unravel! <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's it's not subtle in any way. <laughs> no, when she goes for it, she goes for it. She does. Really she very does. brave. How about you? What did you think? For that one, I was I had the same reaction as you. I I actually laughed out loud at that. Said, "Oh, that that's really good. That is a great line in here mm -hmm. because it does just you know pinpoint exactly the the theme of the film. This idea of an outside appearance versus what's happening on the inside and this." perspective that you know you have as a, an audience as a as a viewer of the film and you find yourself knowing more than what's going on you almost feel like you're the psychotherapist in the situation analyzing everything that's happening in the film and you say oh if you only knew what's happening you wouldn't say that so right, i thought it was right. so clever yeah absolutely and i thought that it was really interesting that the director um uh, the, the writer the screenwriter put that line in Mm -hmm. I thought that was really very, very clever. And what an interesting place to put it, especially on the island and everything is supposed to be looking perfect and looking pretty. And she looks great. And she's very perfect timing in the film, I thought. I agree. I agree. Our next question that I would um, like to ask now is, would you say that the majority of the conflict in the film is a result of Simple's attempt to compartmentalize her life while not being able to really be emotionally honest, um, and that may be resulting in things collapsing around her. Yeah, I, I think it goes along the same thing with, you know, we're always we're always trying to hide who we really are, our authentic selves, because it doesn't look nice. <clears throat> I always think of this image of, um, say you're in a swimming pool and you have the big ball and you take the big ball, big, you know, inflated ball, and you try to push it down um, beneath the water's surface, but it just keeps on popping up. It just can't help itself. That's how I feel about her. She's, 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 we're all damaged. I mean, right? We're all, we all have our, we all have our thing. We all have our baggage. We all have our past. We all have our present. We all have, uh, you know, our family, our DNA, whatever it is. And we can't help it. She, she has to compartmentalize, but I mean, eventually it's just going, the, the dam is just going to break. I, I love that she did that. She's a different person with everybody. I really love the scenes with her, with the young boy. Because he calls her out on stuff that I was so struck by, I really loved that. I, at first, I was like, "Why is he in this film?" But then, it made it it, it made it reveal to me. But um, uh, she's different with all these different people. Then finally, she lets to let herself go and be really messy, be her real, true, authentic self. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could be messy all the time without having to be all you know? I got it together. But I think compartmentalization helps us survive. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's a survival tactic for all of us. I'm a different person than I am with you right now that I am, say, you know, when I go to the grocery store, right? We have to compartmentalize. It's like, oh, I'm going to show this side of myself and then this side. But I also think it it, it, it does, um, for a therapist, I think it can do a lot of damage. Because that's their business, right? And she's not taking her own advice. So... <laughs> <laughs> or her therapist advice. She doesn't listen to her right. therapist either. <laughs> right, exactly. And he calls her out too. Mm -hmm. He got her right in the beginning of the film. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. It, after watching the film, it is funny to go back and see he he calls not only her situation, but he calls everything. He says, "Don't get involved. Don't do this." He yep. he predicts it all. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we've talked a little bit about Sybil herself, but. What about the other characters in the film? So um, the director describes Margot as a double for Sybil. So what parallels do you see between those two characters? And are there any other characters that might be doubled or paralleling each other? I thought a lot about that um, myself. I was wondering if Sybil maybe saw herself in Margot. And it, to me, it's pretty obvious. I mean, they're very similar um, type. Um, uh, 
you know, young, beautiful ingenue kind of thing. Uh, you could see that Sybil in, in younger days, she was probably, you know, a, a, a beautiful, I mean, she's still beautiful, but a, a beautiful young woman, just like Margot is at that at present. Um, I think, <laughs> this is just me, I think that Sybil was probably very envious of Margot's ability to just be a mess. Um, because Margot's emotional roller coaster. I mean, even when she asked her the most inappropriate question about sex, can you talk to me about the sex? I was like, where is she going with this? Is she reliving her passion with Gabrielle? And and I and it was a it was a combination of jealousy and yes, there's mirroring, the combination of a lot of different things. This director, again, what Justine did was really very interesting the whole meta the film and the film and the novel and the real story and and then the young actress with the older woman and i don't even know how old uh virginie is how old is she as an actress is she like 40. probably around there i'm not sure but yeah. that sounds about right mm -hmm. yeah but uh, uh margot the actress that plays margot she's probably in her early 20s mm -hmm. i mean uh playing playing uh, playing with the the past and the present um Yes, parallels, but a lot of jealous, ooh, jealousy, a lot of jealousy. Um, and I thought it was, and this is just me, I thought it was really cruel, and I can't really judge a character, but um, I thought it was really cruel that um, she kind of egged her on in that jealousy. And, well, you said you were going to do this, so now to go do it. I thought it was, oh, and yet heartbreaking, because maybe she also didn't want Margot to go through what she went through with Gabrielle. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Very, and very multi-layered, very multi-layered relationship. It is. And then also seeing the one that maybe should be the most jealous out of everyone in the film is the director of the of the film in, in the in the film. And, and she's very removed. Exactly. She is the one that's not wrapped up in the jealousy. She's very removed. She's very understanding and she says, I have a job to do. I can't think about this. And I'm going to compartmentalize now and I'm gonna yeah. say away from this. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I thought that was, ooh, that was tough because it's like my boyfriend is having, oh great, sex with her and now he's having sex with her, fantastic. But I still have a job to do. And then to let her direct her film, I thought that was, or that, the the love scene. Very dramatic, it's a lot. It, <laughs> it definitely, yes <laughs> it is. Um. Speaking of the film and the film, let's move on to a little bit about that. And we can come back to the end of the movie and the characters and their development in a moment. But mm -hmm. this is a great opportunity to talk about this idea that while we watch the film, we see Margot and Igor, the two lead characters in this other film that's being made in the movie. And so that's when Sybil goes to help Margot. And so from the perspective of the director, of you know a production or a film what strikes you as interesting or particularly challenging from this film and this could be you personally having had experience you know doing this or either what do you think would be a challenging aspect in the film for the director that we see in the film yeah I have to go to, back to an article that I read that um, uh, Justine was interviewed in. She's very brave in that she mentions that when she films the tough scenes that she allows the camera to just continue to roll to um, pull out the most honest and messy performance from her actors. I think the challenge for this was, first of all, the, the first, the biggest challenge for me was the continuity. But I think the other challenge is to get the most honest performance out of the actors without it being campy and without it being melodramatic, because these are these are very heightened emotions that, um, uh, especially Margot is going through. And you know, you've seen soap operas where it's, uh, you know, they're crying and they're hysterical and everything. Keeping it really grounded, keeping it all in reality as if it was really happening in, in real time, I thought that was a challenge for the director. But um, 
I also, <laughs> continuity, uh, the jumping back and forth, ha, like I would have to go, okay, wait, where are we? At which part and why does this matter? I would have to constantly, I mean, you would have to have a storyboard artist to do this uh, uh, brilliantly for you. So you can really track where it is you are in the film and which emotional level you want from the actors. Because again, if she's going back in time and she's dealing with, say, when her mother died and she was still with Gabrielle and she's hysterically crying and she's still a drinker, right? Very, very different emotional response than when she's with her sister and she's no longer drinking and her sister wants to go have a drink and she doesn't know, want to know where the alcohol is, right? So you have to track all those things. So I think that that was probably the most challenging aspect for the director. Filming on an island. Wow. Also very challenging. Stromboli, beautiful, as beautiful as it is. But, you know, you have to do, I mean, they were filming outside. You saw how windy it was, right? You have to deal with all the elements. That's also a challenge. But the raw emotion that you have to get from these actors, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, the slapping, the sex scene. Oh, my gosh, all of that has to be so choreographed. And, oh, my gosh, it has to also be really spontaneous. That's all really, really tough. So again, to go back, to circle all the way back to the director, just letting the film roll, you know, the camera roll while the actors figure it out. And a lot of magic happens in the editing room because all those slaps, one after another, after another, that poor actor, I felt so bad for him. <laughs> Not <I> really. Know. <laughs> But it's interesting. I, I don't know if you uh, read this or heard this in an interview, but I was watching right after I watched the film for the first time. I, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm interested in this. I want to learn a little bit more. And I watched a panel interview with the whole cast. Mm -hmm. And they made a joke. Uh, if someone asked the question, um, you know, what did you do to prepare for your character in this film? And I forget who it was that answered first, but the, the actor said, I wasn't really able to prepare for the character in the film because the way that the film was made is that we were allowed to try things in different ways. And so there wasn't one character that we were playing. And I don't know how much it was a joke and how much was truth, but they all chimed in and said, yeah, you know, we tried things in so many different ways, trying to keep it spontaneous, keep it in a real believable way. And then the film came together in the editing room. So they didn't see their character until it was made after that, editing. That is, that is the beauty, uh, the beauty and the tragedy of film, right? Because it can be a beautiful thing because look at the final product, but in the process of the, as an actor, you're like, wait, what? <laughs> I get to do what? That's not my through line. That wasn't what I planned. That wasn't my research, right? So yeah, beautiful. It's amazing. Cool. I, I couldn't imagine. I wonder, yeah. I, I wonder how she came to that, but have to ask her. Well, and I love that we're talking about the different approaches that the director might have had. And, you know, like we said, in this film, there are those different layers. And there's the, the fact that the director is actually, you know, directing the real film that's being filmed. And then there's the director that's directing the film inside the film. And so as a viewer, you know, we're watching these actors get direction on how to perform in different scenes. Like you mentioned the slapping scene or the scene on the boat that where they're the reconciliation scene between uh, Margot and Igor's characters on the boat. So what do you think is the intention of spending so much time on watching that direction on watching these actors perform? I mean, is it touching on the layers of reality like we mentioned, or is it teaching Sybil anything about her own life? Um, do these specific scenes connect Margot and Sybil in any way? So what did you think about that? Oh boy. As an, uh, as an actor, I always have uh, very strong opinions about sex scenes because I feel they're very gratuitous um, and indulgent. Um, this particular way, this particular scene, the way it was done to me was a big mind, um, uh, messing with the mind. Um, I thought it was, is it called a psychodrama? I, I forget the actual, I read, I read an article, I think someone mentioned psychodrama. I was like, oh, this would give me therapy for years. So I thought how fascinating, 
um, as a, a woman who had just treated this lovely lady, Margot, and then just had sex with the lead actor, the director jumps ship, literally. I mean, how metaphorical, she literally jumps ship and she's the one who's steering the helm, for Christ's sakes, and um, leaves the therapist to figure it out and to help these two people reconcile their differences using a sex scene. I just thought it was, I thought it was really twisted. I didn't, I, I didn't have a, a, a thought about Margot and Sybil and characters. I just thought, oh my gosh, what would I do if I was in that situation? And, and not to mention the director, Justine, what, what was she thinking? Why did she, what was her commentary on that? Um, do directors sometimes when they have to deal with bratty actors who don't want to work together and then all of a sudden you're like, well, I'm just, I'm out of here, you do it. And then I, I thought a lot about, again, the film within a film, is it a commentary on how actors can be jerks, you know, how they can be divas? And then at the end of the day, I'm going to let somebody else who has nothing to do with this film direct you. I'm out of here. And you guys have at it. If you can do something with it, fantastic. Uh, it was, it was, I, my mind was a little messy after that. I just, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> it pulls at so many different emotions because you obviously feel for everyone or almost everyone maybe in, in different ways, right? And so you, you feel for the director that is just completely just, just, over it. she can't handle it exactly she just has to has to leave she can't handle it anymore you feel for sybil who is in what i can only imagine is a, the most awkward situation of any human in the history of the world i mean that is just such a unique experience that she's going through and then margot's character having to push through and act in a way that is so opposite of how she's really feeling in the moment yeah i i thought i really thought a lot about i was like this therapist is crossing boundaries that are just a mess, but she has so much at stake because she wants to get her book done, right? Which is a whole nother, I mean, talk about inappropriate. Wow. Uh, cross, <laughs> stepping over, I mean, those are boundaries, smashing boundaries. And then poor Margot has just had an abortion and now she has to give in to uh, lust. I mean, she probably doesn't even feel human at that point. So I just thought it was psychologically damaging for the characters. Mm -hmm. Thank God it's a movie, right? <laughs> but uh, it, go ahead. It does make you wonder, did Justine Trier, did, did she have any sort of personal experience that could inform the situation? Because some things like that exact situation are just, they're so unique. Yes. I don't know how anyone could come up with that exact thing off the top of their head. I mean, you know, did she have some sort of, very along with the, you know, the writer of the film, did what what influenced yeah. some of these things to yeah, take place? Intel. It's like, oh, this huge drama happened on set. I can't wait to tell you. And then it's like, I'm writing, I'm using this, right? I'm gonna write this all down. So we- Which is what Sybil does mm -hmm. with her book. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, very, mm -hmm. very interesting, yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that. Um, the The last thing that I wanted to kind of talk through with you is the ending of the film. Mm -hmm. And so with the ending of the film, we do have this feeling of culmination. We do have this kind of closure in a way that does happen. And so at the end of the film, I'm just going to read a few things that Sybil says because we hear her talking as if it's almost an inner monologue that she's or a mantra she's saying to herself something that she might be convincing herself of as mm -hmm. well as informing the audience but Sybil says um I no longer think of Margot or Gabrielle I've stepped back from those around me I see them as characters Etienne has no access to me we have nothing concrete but I like what he represents I see very clearly now and I understand one thing my life is fiction and I can rewrite it however I like. I can do anything, change anything, create anything. I'm at the heart of my very choice. Gabrielle is dead to me now. So 
with that last scene, like I said, we do have this idea of culmination, but wow, what's some some huge statements to say at the end that are just so... <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought it was really an uh, interesting placement too with the question of uh, who's my father from Selma also, mm -hmm. that's also at the end. So it just sounds like to me, from personal experience, it almost sounds like the end of a cycle of a chapter, like of a, um, almost like at the end of a, therap a therapist's session, if you will. So in other words, um, you're with your therapist 10 years and then you're finally, I'm cured, I'm done, I don't need to come here anymore. To me, it almost sounds like what you would say to a therapist to convince yourself, I don't need you anymore, um, <laughs> which I, uh, I can't imagine that that's true because how can you be so far removed again this compartmentalization idea that you mentioned earlier um, maybe this is how she has to maybe maybe she has to tell herself this in order to convince herself because this is how she has to move forward from now on she did so much damage to herself that she has to take it she has to put it in a box and say goodbye to it so the reconciliation of Gabrielle of Margot of the messiness, you know, how wasted she got at that party and just fell over everything. And uh, she had to finally say, oh, that was that part. I'm putting that there and I'm now going to look ahead, almost like closing a chapter of a book. So uh, it was uh, that was hard to hear. Um, I'm not a big fan of, you know, oh, everything's gonna be wonderful at the end of the movie, right? Because that's not how life is. But I, I felt it was very um, cold, but almost like that's how she has to be able to survive. If she lets herself feel like she did with Gabrielle, she lets herself go. Uh, and, and also the jealousy that I talked about with Margot because Margot was all messy and everything. She allows herself that she can't be this put together person that you know she's created as a therapist and now as a writer she can kind of go in as like a detective and you know take a look at other people's lives and how other people uh, act but um but kind of all behind a facade so it was very cold for me but it made sense i i agree it's it it makes sense and you can see her perspective but at the same time we know that some of the things that she said are just not true right we or we assume as the audience with that you know maybe she's back into the denial that we mentioned earlier i thought a lot about that and i was also curious about if she, like, is she gonna start abusing again um because we never really find out right about. and so that's a question actually that we we have here so um you know a student submitted what happened at the end? Did Sybil's husband just take her back and ignore the infidelities and the drunkenness? And is she drinking again? What what does happen at the end? So what was your takeaway from the from the end scene? Well, especially when he doesn't let her come in when Margot brings her home and he's like, No, you're drunk, go get help and all this kind of stuff. And then the, there's this beautiful montage of the family together and everything. Who knows how far into the future that was? Was that a week later, a month later? And the kids are still pretty young in that. Um, but you know, you always think about people that have kids and how much at stake when you break up. So maybe she doesn't. Maybe she doesn't hold a teen in high esteem, and he took her back because he really loves her and she just kind of reconciled that i don't let him see me i know what he is he's fine he rep what it, whatever he represents so this whole not white picket fence idea but the family unit um yeah a lot of questions at the end and i really didn't believe her that she forgot about Margot. exactly it's it's hard to believe that especially with i mean just from a you know practical standpoint with her book that she wrote you know yeah, that's going to be, she's going to be talking about it for years. Mm -hmm. There's no way that she could put this phase behind her. Yeah, 
I mean, geez, I, I did something stupid last week. I'm still beating myself up. Really? You're going to forget about this whole tragedy, you know, that you create, you know, she created this monster, really, you know, this whole tragedy in her life. Oh, and I'm, I'm done. <laughs> it's, like, no. it's, it's hard to believe okay. it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, with that idea, in the film, she says earlier that uh, that she does say real life is just built on shit. And so she says that to Margot earlier in the film. But a question is, you know, does anything matter? Are you know, are we free to feel emptiness to those that are around us? And can you lie to one another, even about subjects as serious as the conversation that she has with her daughter about? the you know selma's father yeah. so what is your perspective on that and it i think it ventures a little bit into denial maybe but what, how does all of this come into play well i mean it's a very existential question you know what's what's like the point of it all right like why bother with anything if it's just all shit <laughs> and i think it's a very defeatist mentality i think it's very french forgive me um <laughs> Um, I remember my my ex mother in law was from France, and um, I had an argument with my ex husband, and then she was like, "Life's a bitch, and then you die." And I was like, "Absolutely." So personal experience with that, um, but um, uh, I don't think that she believes that. I think that she probably didn't want to talk about what was really underneath it all. That that life is tragic, and that. Uh, when she says shit, uh, it's dismissive, isn't it? Don't you find that it was dismissive? Instead of trying to pick it apart and find out well, why and how can we be happy and how can we make everything um, better? I, I keep on thinking about uh, the guy at the top of the movie, Basile, uh, um, how he said, um, uh, inspiration is a lie and hard work is pointless, I think was his... Um, very defeatist mentality about being a writer. Um, I, I don't know. I think it just might be a, a big chip on the shoulder. I don't know. What do you think? I agree. And I think that that's such an important moment at the beginning of the film that, you know, it happens, I think, as the opening credits are, are happening. It's a scene that oh. very much starts the film and it sets the scene for everything else. It, it instills a fear in Sybil that mm -hmm. we see not maybe be, be the base of everything in the film, mm -hmm. but it is a fear that we see direct links of the results that come from that, from his their conversation about being a writer. And th there is an aspect that I think she is desperate a little bit to, to have success in the second novel. Yes, yes. And um, he kind of squashes her hopes, you know, kind of throwing her that dose of reality, like, eh, and, and, and she's like, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. But he foreshadows the whole movie. I mean, just when he starts talking about the whole, I don't mean to digress, but just he foreshadows that whole thing about the, the, the news stories, the text message suicide and the girl in Italy on murder charges and dealing with two the, you know, the Italians and the United States justice system. I was like, oh gosh. And then people writing books about that. And I was like, oh, what a fantastic device. Cause she literally, you know, life imitating art, art imitating life, that whole thing. And she ran with it. Cause he says at the end of it all, it's like a chick flick. And that I went, oh, that's where the story is gonna go. Because this is, it's this passionate love affair, right? They're actors, right? So that's already, there's gossip and all that behind it. And then, of course, they're filming a movie. And then she gets pregnant. And then he breaks up. She breaks up the relationship between the director. I, I was like, oh, it's all the makings of a, of a perfect chick flick. Romance and cheating, right? So I just loved, I loved his, I loved that character completely from the start. I, I was wish he was... In the movie more but sorry to digress no i agree i think that that's such a, a an important part of the movie that you know that one character 
has so much of an influence on the entire film. This was a genius way to create a framework to yeah. preface and then also to, like you said, just foreshadow many yeah. things in the film. And then to also challenge her because he says, no, you can't do it, but send me your stuff anyway. And how mm -hmm. misogynistic was that? I just got really mad, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is interesting to to bring up though, because you know this is a movie that was directed by a female director, and so we have these things that are from a female perspective that are done in a very interesting way. I think I think the female perspective in the film is done in a very interesting way. Um, we have these issues and these things that are coming up, and it it, it you almost forget sometimes that it is from a female director's perspective and. Mm -hmm it's treated in a very unique way, I think, and in a way that I think is meant to challenge the audience and make them think about perspective yeah. in all of these different things that can happen in life. Absolutely. I, mm -hmm. I, I have noticed a nice shift um, because there's more opportunity for <clears throat> the female voice, um, female protagonists. And, um, but the, you can tell that there's a big difference between when a male directs it and versus when a female directs it. And um, I, I, I felt um, at ease with, uh, uh, of course, how she handled certain scenes, like the sex scene, like the slapping, like the nervous breakdowns. I felt a, a nice sensitivity towards that. So that was refreshing for me. Um, yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting to watch a female protagonist. Enjoyable and, and, and yet so flawed. So flawed, so real, but you were like, oh my God, she's going to do that. But you were still, I was still rooting for her. Still wanted her to be okay at the end. Exactly. And in such a way that you are so invested in her story throughout the entire film and in the end, you know, you, as the viewer, you, you are just sucked in from the very first minute. Like I said, you find your, or I found myself psychoanalyzing the film as it was going on and creating yeah. another level of that reality there. Yeah. I, I, I was really uh, taken back by her for, well, not her first, one of her clients, I think his name was Boris. And he got so upset and he was like, you've stolen like seven years of my work, seven years of my life. How does that make you feel? And I was like, I was so, so gutted by that. I thought it was, I thought it was brilliantly done and the blame and, 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 and how Sybil responded to that was beautiful. She just sat there and she just took it. I thought it was like, I wonder if she's in therapy, right? like the, the the therapy made me think about therapy <laughs> so i thought that was really well done i agree well thank you so much for all of your ideas and thoughts on this film i um i've enjoyed our conversation and really thank you for bringing your perspective um to a, a interesting film an exciting film um and so Ooh, thank you so much for being here with us today thank you so much for having so um, I'm going to take this opportunity just to talk about our next film that's coming up. So our next film in the Tournée Film Festival is Soleil O. And so we hope everybody and you, Professor Fuchs, will join us for that film as well. And we will have um, the introduction and Q&A by Dr. Aaron Lee Mock with that film. Um, but again, thank you everyone um, who has participated in this festival, faculty, students. You guys are what's making this festival so great. So thank you so much, Professor Fuchs. It's fantastic to talk with you. Great to talk with you, Claire. Thank you so much. Well, I'm Claire Ezekiel um, from the French program here at West Georgia. And again, thank you so much for being part of our festival.